Hey, hey you blink, I'll cut your eyelids off. Don't you no. blink. I got you. Let's go. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition here of the Mount of Steel podcast. We, of course, yours truly, Charles Pride Richie, right now. As uh, we are looking right now for the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, they have wrapped up two in a row, believe it or not. Yes, sir. It is a win streak for the first time going back to last year when they started off the year 11-0, and uh, defeating the Baltimore uh, Ravens on December uh, 2nd of last season. The game, which should have happened on Thanksgiving, I did not uh, turn out to be end with a promising finish. Ended up uh, having a big uh, losing streak of the rest of the way, as everyone may remember at that moment, where they lost four out of their remaining five regular season games, plus a playoff game. So basically five out of the remaining six games uh, that season right there. And you saw how everything was starting off uh, this season right there when the Steelers started off. I mean, open up on the road uh, versus the Bills. Uh, you figure it'd be a nice uh, playoff victory right there. I mean, uh, opening season victory on the road, excuse me. I mean, uh, a lot of fans were uh, pumped up right there, ready to go. And you figure coming back from that 10 nothing deficit at the half uh, this season and showing what they had in the second half, how they came back methodically, defensively, they were able to slow down the Bills the rest of the way. And uh, win that game, you probably figured everything would have been A-OK. Well, for the time being, for right now, the Steelers, uh, they definitely got their work uh, cut out for them right now. Uh, like I said, they just uh, wrapped up wins over the Broncos and Seattle Seahawks at home. And for a team that has been struggling at home uh, this season, uh, for the most part, I mean, let's be honest with ourselves here. I mean, at this point... They now find themselves at two and two in Heinz Field this season. I mean, which is uh, kind of crazy right there in a way uh, this season is going. I'm not saying they don't have their hiccups, but I mean, at the same time, it is pretty refreshing. We can capitalize on that. They got their bye week uh, right now. They're uh, getting ready to rest right now. And when they come out, they'll be facing the Cleveland Browns. And more importantly, the Pittsburgh Steelers, they find themselves in the seventh seed in the AFC playoff picture. I mean, who would have thought that for right now uh, after starting off, going from last place in the division to seventh in the wild card picture? Uh, you got to be uh, pretty uh, excited and feeling optimistic right now if you're a Steeler fan. But like I said, I always maintain my position right now uh, with Mike Tomlin. The only thing where I get pause. Cause for pause is that he is a coach that has proven many a times where you have to ha- where he has to start off fast out of the gate because whatever he starts off uh, solo in the regular season usually doesn't translate in a playoff success. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to help snap that jinx uh, coming up in that game. But for right now, uh, like I said, let's go ahead and recap this game right now: Steelers versus Seahawks in uh, week number uh, six right now. As the Steelers improved the 500, barely uh, beating a Gina, Gino Smith-led team. But I would definitely argue on that as we looked at, I mean, uh, Alex Collins definitely had a lot to say in this game, especially in the second half, which is a big-time kudos to Pete Carroll right there. I mean, we're always talking about Mike Tomlin, how you know players love to play for him and how respected he is not allowing his uh, team to throw on the towel. You can definitely say the same for Pete Carroll right there, too. I mean, he was also just as good as far as rallying the troops and making some big adjustments when they had to be made. I mean, you think about it. I mean, in this game right here, I mean, the Steelers, well, let's be honest, in this game right here at the at the half, uh, when they're uh, – they shut out the Seahawks in the first half. It was 14-zip at halftime. Uh, right there, and where we saw uh, two touchdowns scored, I mean, they're executing on all, I mean, executing methodically little by little, and they were two for two in the red zone right there, Uh, one rushing touchdown and a passing touchdown in the half. Now, remember, the rushing touchdown did did come courtesy of Eric Ebron right there in that uh, contest. Uh, which was a huge uh, play right there that kind of helped open things up 
you almost kind of got the sense that maybe it was going to be like the Steelers night where they're going to like uh, sell down. They really close thing out. That was a one yard uh, rush right there uh, from E. Brown. And later on, guess what happened? We swing things over to the second half. I mean, in that, and by the way, too, before we go into the second half, I mean, let's recap. I mean, in that game, uh, Seahawks only had 65 yards versus the Steelers, 177 yards in the first half. And well, when we looked at it right there, too, I mean, basically, uh, the second half, I mean, you, you go from like a controlling time possession big time in the first half, uh, more than double. 20 minutes and 45 seconds, the Steelers did possess the ball right there. Uh, that would dramatically change, thanks to Pete Carroll utilizing the run game. I mean, in that. And you look at it right there, too. Eight out of their 15 first downs in the second half uh, for the Seahawks were gained off the ground right there. Uh, they went one for five on third down conversions. I mean, not the prettiest, but I mean, they were able to move the chains a lot more than that. I mean, we're. You didn't see many uh, third down conversions because that's how good they're uh, keeping the ball on their side of the field right there. I mean, you saw them right there. I mean, just uh, challenging. And I think when, when you when you see teams try and attack a Steelers team, I, I, I saw it this way. The, the good old-fashioned way you'd be a, a Mike Tomlin-led Steelers team with Keith Butler, I mean, aside from – I mean, which I was surprised they were able to attack him on the ground, but quick passes. I mean, making your linebackers go on the cover right there. And that, that's how you do it right there. Quick pass, quick slants, quick screens, and you're able to get some yards right there. And, and for the Steelers right there, I mean, in that, I mean, you saw what started to happen. I mean, right there, I mean, throughout that contest. I mean, later on, because, uh, I mean, they only had, they had one less sack in the second half versus two, which they had in the first half right there. And also, too, I mean, like the running game. I mean, think about this. 20 carries for 129 yards for the Seattle Seahawks versus Steelers, who had 11 carries for 60 yards. Now, in the first half, it was 58 yards gained on the ground versus the Seahawks, 18 yards. Uh, same yards per attempt right there, 3.6 uh, for each uh, team. And for the, for the most part, I mean, you just saw right here. Now, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I was not too thrilled. Definitely not very impressed. I mean, when you always look at this uh, team right here, you always continue to look at, like, what is the standard for a Mike Tomlin-led team? when uh, trying to, like, uh, put teams away or how they always continue to allow people to hang around. I mean, that's just the bottom line. I mean, teams find a way to hang around. It doesn't matter what the competition is. I, you see what happens right here. And for the most part, too, uh, I mean, listen, I, I also got to give uh, Najee Harris some credit here, too. He was hanging in there, too. I mean, he didn't have a pretty night, but I mean, he still did enough to like really uh, imagine hang in there. I mean, later in the game, I mean, you saw the Steelers continue to go into the running game right there. He was able to scrap up some uh, tough yardage right there. I mean, in that game, and they were able to like uh, put their, uh, I mean, set himself up nicely. Now, I will say this though, too. I mean, on here, I mean, when you also look at the stat lines for both of these teams right here, I mean, uh, Ben Rosper, he completed, I mean, for the night, I mean, in this game, when it was all said and done uh, for this uh, game, uh, for his uh, passing night, uh, he completed 73% of his passes, where he was 29 of 40 right there, uh, for th throwing for 226 net total yards. He only got sacked one time for three yards. And the Steelers would end up finishing the night uh, gaining 119 yards off the ground off the 30 carries. Uh, the Seattle Seahawks would have 25 more, thanks in large partly due to the second half, like I just saw uh, highlighted a few moments ago right there. And and for the most part, too, I, I will say this, too. I mean, the Steelers, where they got very uh, fortunate, too. I mean, when you uh, saw this, I mean, I mean, 
think think about it too. I mean, uh, penalties. I think they did a good job keeping control on that. It was only five for thirty-eight. Seahawks have one more penalty in this game, six for forty-five. I mean, in this contest, and there you have it right there. But I mean, other people like really guys like stepped up in this game right here. I mean, you saw like the tandem of Cam Hayward and uh, TJ Watt. TJ Watt, who definitely proved to be the big time hero uh, in this game right here to help, I mean, uh, you know, put the Steelers and set them up nicely. I mean, plays had to be made on defense, even though things were starting to get out of control. I know there was a crazy mess going on right there uh, towards the end of the game where you saw, like, uh, right there, I mean, uh, at the end, I think it was like a TJ uh, or D DK Metcalf, excuse me, DK Metcalf, uh, who uh, right there, I mean, which was the biggest controversy of the game for it won uh, uh, overtime. Let's uh, look at that one more time. So basically, you saw Geno Smith through passes DK uh, Metcalf, and then it was recovered by uh, Swain of the Seahawks. Uh, Russell Wilson went out there to urge him to like uh like hurry up to bring the ball back uh to like you know spike it uh then step out of bounds uh, he made the catch right there and took about four steps and then the ball was knocked loose uh by James Pierre uh Steelers who I thought should have done a better job when I was watching trying to recover and then pay attention too close so my apologies on that but. I mean, Swain was able to recover it for the Seahawks right there. And then next thing you know, uh, here's where the big where the big problem comes in at. Uh, the, the biggest, one of the biggest debates is, too, was he allowed to touch the ball and hurry it up uh, to the line of scrimmage for them to spike it? I mean, usually that's the ref's job. You're supposed to be touching the football, from what I understand. I'm not sure what the clarity is on that, but... I mean, the referee, from my understanding, he tapped it real quick, but there was a, a little bit of a time delay in the scoreboard uh, stadium clock, first clock that everyone saw on TV. Because if you looked uh, clearly and closely, uh, we, what we all did see was after it was hurried up, uh, rushed back uh, to uh, Geno Smith to spike the ball. When he did spike the ball, there was one second left after he spiked it. Then the time hit zero. So he spiked with one second left. Then it went to zero. But right around that time, that's when the referees were uh, like signaling to work out everyone's attention. They need to review the play of the completed catch right there. And uh, that that's the time right there. And they wanted to make sure there was no incomplete pass or whatever. Uh, basically, when they confirmed it was a catch. Uh, it gave him three additional seconds to like uh, put him back in position where they would have to pick up from that moment with three seconds left to spike the ball. And it ends up uh, happening at the CL Seahawks. Uh, Harvey, no, not Harvey, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, for, for, for this moment, uh, Myers hit a 43 yard field goal to tie up the game right there, which sent the game into overtime in that moment. So, I mean, Mike Tomlin was definitely clearly uh, displeased, as you can imagine right there. Uh, definitely a clear uh, mess right there. I mean, a lot of people from the Steelers standpoint, Bob Labriello made a good point right there, too. I mean, it's like you also got to like, be preaching to your players. If you're Pete Carroll in that situation, DK Metcalf, you're making the catch. Get out of bounds. I mean, what are you doing right there? I mean, especially when you get the ball knock loose, this is a fumble. But, I mean, before that, I mean, just before the ball was stripped, get out of bounds. I mean, you're, you're, you're taking a huge risk of losing such valuable time right there in that situation where you may not be so lucky. I mean, as of turning out, I mean, still, I mean, I understood, I mean, I mean, when, when are we watching an NFL game these days? When it comes to close plays, expect to be some sort of like review. Unfortunately, we have this issue with instant replay. It's just, you know, it's not really surprising. It was definitely a lot of people's minds. Uh, people, a lot of people in Pittsburgh media across the National Football League thought it was unnecessary to review. 
I mean, why would they have to clearly review something that was clearly an obvious a catch? I mean, it, and it more than likely had to come from the New York office or someone from above who was watching that to commute the signal to the referees, hey, this needs to be reviewed. And that that's just a problem either, either way. I, I was not surprised that it was going to have to come to a review. I mean, once that close, I mean, like game on the line right there, a uh, big moment. Uh, listen, this is the National Football League. Much love watching the sport as well as the Premier Leagues. I mean, it doesn't seem to find its way without any type of controversy right there. I mean, you got to give – I got to tip my cap and uh, give a round of applause to the Seattle Seahawks. Pete Carroll right there, magnificent job. They definitely came to play right there in that game. Uh, I can't say so much for Geno Smith in that game. I think he definitely gave a galley an effort right there. Uh, he would definitely finish off the game. Uh, in this contest right here, uh, going 23 of 32, completing 72% of his passes right here. Not bad completion percentage uh, for that night. For 165 net total yards right there, uh, one touchdown. And uh, each quarterback uh, lose, losing a fumble right there that was uh, stripped. Uh, well, Ben Roethlisberger wasn't stripped. I think uh, what happened was with him, when watching that, I mean, he – moved his arm forward, then went to reset. When the ball was being tipped down, he lost control of the ball, which was technically like a fumble right there, uh, which did get recovered. So at the end of the day, uh, listen, uh, ugly win right there. Uh, and for the most part, definitely a lot of huge red flags being waved. But I mean, at the end of the day, I, I will say this. Uh, watching this team, it's sure going to feel good to not be in last place than what they were for like almost a month right now. I I'll tell you that. I don't want to be in fourth place again if I'm this team. You know what? You live the fight another day right now. Uh, you got the Cleveland Browns coming up. A uh, big game right now, uh, first two. And you look at it, how things uh, really start to shape up here uh, from this point out. So let's also look at it too. Uh, Cam Hayward, he reaches uh, 60 sacks, uh, taking down Geno Smith for an eight-yard loss. Uh, he now rakes, according to Angela Technelia of uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, communications uh, p personnel, uh, saying that he's tied for fifth in Steelers history. Uh, Joe, Joey Porter, a third amongst active defense tackles and 17th among all active uh, players right now with uh, his 60th uh, sack. And also, too, uh, P.J. Watt became the first player to have uh, two sacks and a forced fumble in overtime since sacks were first tracked for the Thunders beginning in 1982 right there. So congratulations to those men, uh, proving once again why they are just as much a tandem uh, for this Steelers uh, team. So let's go ahead and get some game balls in this uh, game right here. Offense, I'm going to go ahead and once again on offense, give it to Najee Harris. Why? Uh, finish night leading the team with 30 touches for 127 yards of scrimmage. Uh, look for a lot more games where he's going to be leading in scrimmage yards, obviously. I mean, he had a receiving touchdown off of seven receptions for 46 yards. Also, he had 24 uh, carries for 81 yards, averaging 3.4 yards per attempt. And then on the defensive side, I mean, the, the million-dollar man right here, T.J. Watt right there, uh, proving why he deserves uh, to have a full – Fully guaranteed contract, being one of the top uh, edge rushers in this game. Uh, why he paid this guy two sacks in the forced fumble in overtime, the final sack and strip uh, dropped Geno Smith for a two yard loss, uh, which put them at their own 13 yard line to see how Seahawks did. And he also led the team that night with three tackles for loss losses and uh, three pass deflections right there. So, I mean, if anyone wants to continue, like, question, like, why was he, like, not practicing with uh, teammates, I mean, like, team drills and training camp or whatever throughout the preseason, I mean, he was keeping the body in shape. I'll be honest with you, I think this could definitely put all the concerns and questions uh, to bed right now. I mean, yeah, he did have the injured groin, he hurt in the second game versus the Raiders, but at the end of the day, uh, and he, he's probably still a little bit 
a ways to come from like being fully recovered. But I'll tell you what, I'll take this version any time of the week right there. The hustle, the guy, I mean, he just balls. I mean, he is a guy right here who's trying to become like the unsung leader on this defense. I mean, for the future. I mean, he 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 makes plays uh, happen. Definitely could change, be disruptive, a huge game changer. I mean, when uh, a Paul's got to go live and face his defense right there. Now, the defense has kind of taken a few steps back. I mean, of course, I mean, this year when you really look at it, I mean, for the most part, I mean, right now, I mean, total yards, I mean, you're about like 12 right now in the league with, in, in total defense. I mean, 26 and takeaways right now. I mean, that's my my legitimate beef I have with this team right now. And where you only got two interceptions per year along with five uh, or three fumble recoveries right there. Two, I mean, for, for the most part. And I, I just I just feel like right now, I mean, only having five takeaways, that needs to get better a lot better because honestly I, ju I just don't see where we look at right now where we look at this team i mean defensively i, I still think i mean a lot of people keep insisting when this team gets fully healthy things are going to be all right again i really believe right now i mean uh camp sutton right now i gotta see more out of him i'm not sure if i'm still sold on him as a starter going forward with this team. I mean, think about it. I mean, the only guys that got interceptions on this team are Terrell Evans and James Pierre right now. I mean, James Pierre had the nice game-stealing interception a week ago, which uh, helped snap this, uh, I mean, losing streak right here, the three-game losing streak they had. I mean, but then, like I said, too, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think he's just getting the benefit of the doubt over the guy like Steve Nelson because he was a top 100 pick in the draft in 2017, third round pick. And for right now, I, that is definitely to be very concerning right there. You, you wonder why there's a little bit of pause for cause for pause right now with this team possibly not being sold as playoff contenders. I mean, their defense the last two years, I mean, which put them right on the doorsteps of making the playoffs. Of course, they didn't finish in 2019, where once again they had control. They lost control of that. But then last year, too, I mean, when the turnover bail, too, I mean, you look at last year where they were, despite their sloppy finish down the stretch, I mean, for the most part, I mean, they were they finished plus nine in turnover ratio that year. That's that's where I gotta see more out of this team, and that's just where I get very concerned. I mean, if you're Mike Tomlin, and of course, right now, I mean, uh, Tara Austin Senior, who's working alongside, I mean, Keith Butler, you gotta think right now. I mean, you gotta see more out of this because. That's, it's only going to get you so far right now when we look at it. I, I just, I really want to see more. I mean, uh, just a better uh, showing, I mean, at this point. I, I just, I just get very concerned that at the end of the day right now, I, it's just uh, where are we going to go from here? Because when you look at the Steelers right now, it's, I mean, they're minus two internal ratio right now, uh, which is 20th in the league, minus two uh, at this point. Well, and then you also got like uh, the Ravens and Browns who are a notch below right now. You got the Ravens at ranked 22nd at minus two. Two, and then the Browns minus three, twenty fourth in the league right now. The Browns, ironically, or not ironically, but surprisingly, supposed to be having a good season. 
they are last place in the division. It's their turn to be last right now. And uh, they got a big game uh, coming up uh, this Thursday night, which is definitely a game to watch out for as it comes to uh, playoff implications. But at the same time, too, I mean, listen, it is what it is. Mike Dick had always say before, NFL, was it usually stand for? Not for long. Once again, uh, this is Charles Project Richard right here. Once again, if you guys want to follow me on social media, you can definitely do so. You can follow me on Twitter at Mount Steel CGR and on Instagram at Mount Steel Nation. Uh, Steelers win two in a row for the first time since last season right there when they defeated the Ravens. Uh, start which was our 11th straight victory of the season right there where they started off 11 and oh I know I keep we keep beating the drum on that but this is where they're at uh seem to get themselves uh, calmed down they found a way to survive that game against the Seahawks crazy roller coaster of a ride but right now we'll see where it goes from here I mean f- from this time uh and see if they could be able to ho- hang on make a run. Now that possibly snap an over three jinx with Mike Tomlin, where his team starts off slow out of the gate as one and three. Can they make the playoffs this time around? I hope so. I want to be wrong. I, it's just, you know, the facts are the facts right there with Mike Tomlin. I mean, and there, there's like some debate like going on right again, like on the Cook and Joe show. I mean, like uh, discussing who was a better coach between Bill Cowher and Mike Tomlin. And you know who my answer is going to be. I'm going to go with still Bill Cowher at the end of the day. And it's not just because he had like, you know, he didn't have good quarterbacks until like later with Ben Rodgers. He did have a decent one with Neil Dow until he fell apart in Super Bowl 30. But with Bill Cowher, like I always maintain with him, he was a buyer finisher. I mean, in the when having an 11 point lead in late games, I mean, especially going into the fourth quarter when it was like 11 point lead or more, 113 victories, one loss and a tie, whatever building an 11 point lead in the game. I mean, that, that, I mean, that, that's the thing I like about Bill Cowher more. I think Bill Cowher was more of a better closer in games. Yeah, you could say all you want about Mike Tomlin not having no losing seasons. No one's going to question that. But at the same time, too, I think Mike, I mean, Bill Cowher, too, for the most part, I mean, he definitely did have to, like, really, like, change things up from time to time, where he had to make some adjustments. I mean, where it was, like, shuffling with – uh below average uh, quarterbacks or middle of the road quarterbacks who he had to deal with. I mean, and playoffs, I mean, I mean, he gets the edge over Tom because mainly because of that last run he had where they finally, he started winning games on the road for the first time in his career as a Steeler where all his road games were won that season. He never won a road up until 2005, the year they won their Super Bowl. The one the one for the thumb. I mean, that just uh, never happened. I mean, other than that, prior to that point, when it came to uh, road uh, playoff uh, games, I mean, in Bill Cowher's uh, career, he was 0 for 3 at that point. I mean, and then for that season right there, I mean, were you finally, uh, you go 4 and 3 right there? Pretty amazing stuff. I mean, yeah, Mike Tomlin right now, I mean, he, I think he's eight and eight in the playoffs right now for the most part. I mean, in his career, I mean, he's getting close to uh, passing Bill Cowher for wins. He's got 148 wins, 81 losses, and a tie. Bill Cowher, which, by the way, who also has a tie in his uh, career, which came back in 2002, right now, he is 149, 90, and 1. So, I mean, the, the, the record is definitely it, it, astonishingly there, right there. Tomlin has a better win percentage. And for the most part, I mean, 
Bill Cowher's 623. And then, like I said, Mike Tom was 8-8 eight eight in the playoffs, and he had Bill Cowher 12-9 in the playoffs right there. But, uh, like I said, I, 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 I'm I just taking from a personal standpoint, I'll go Bill Cowher. But I'll probably admit, I mean, realistically, if you had to ask me objective standpoint, I would go with Mike Tomlin. But, yeah, I, I just look for Cowher for those purposes. Better closer and slightly better in the playoffs. And uh, like I said, but right now, Mike Tomlin, he needs one win to match Bill Cowher. And one more after that. So basically two more wins to pass Bill Cowher uh, for the all-time uh, wins as a Steeler coach. As I mean, in the Steelers uh, ranking as coach right there. So, I mean, what a stop. I mean, an amazing career right there. Then you also look at the other standard of excellence, uh, too, Chuck Noll right there. I mean, who also had a phenomenal career. I mean, uh, crafting that team. 193 uh, victories, 148 losses, and a tie. And I, I would love to see if Mike Tomlin could get to that point where he could eventually pass Chuck Noll. I don't know if that's going to happen, but. That's definitely going to be some time, I mean, right there. I mean, just to see that happen, if that ever does. But, man, I, I'll tell you, this is uh, definitely a great ride for right now. Uh, and like I said right now, who knows what's going to be life beyond Ben Roethlisberger uh, coming up, like, real soon as we look at. But let's go ahead and transition right here on the Mass Deal podcast right now. Uh, AFC playoff picture. Steelers find themselves uh, two games back in the AFC North. And then also they're seventh in the AFC wildcard right now. Now, can the Steelers hold on to another scenario where they can control their own destiny? Uh, now, don't forget, too. Now, let's look at that for a second. I mean, when we look at I mean, he, here's the main difference right now. So you got, like, the Broncos right now who are – Three and three at this point. I mean, uh, looking to uh, get going right now. I mean, the Broncos for right now. I mean, looking to try and like a uh, rebound in a hurry here. But I mean, I mean they've been on a three-game losing streak. I mean, losing game with the Ravens at home in Denver, losing on the road to the Steelers, and then losing to the Vegas Raiders right there. I mean, like I said, I mean, when you look at it, they haven't beaten a winning team at all this season. I mean, you think about it. I mean, you have, I mean, both teams, like in like a Giants and a Jets team that's got one win apiece. I mean, for their season, I mean, Giants are one and five, Jets are one and four. Jaguars finally got their first victory uh, this year in London. I mean, uh, by defeating the Miami uh, Dolphins 23-20, to 20, makes it a game winning field goal right now. But, I mean, here, here's where we got to be a little careful right here, too, because now remember, Steelers do own the head-to-head -head tiebreaker versus Broncos. So, a scenario like this right here, and – you look at it because followed by the Broncos, who the Steelers are ahead of for the seventh uh, seed. Next up, you got the Kansas City uh, Chiefs, who will be the number nine seed. And the uh, Chiefs, right now, who are three and three, more thanks to like a, a horrendous defense. But I mean, the Steelers own uh, the tiebreaker, the, the conference record right now. Steelers are two and two in the AFC. Chiefs are only one and three right now. So, I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, for this time, when you really look at as far as how they're trying to get their season, I mean, on the right track, I mean, it's trying to keep this uh, train rolling right now. I mean, the Chiefs, I mean, yeah, I mean, only one and three right now, conference record. Steelers are two and two. So that's where they hold that. But then if, like, the Browns are able to win this game, 
I mean, let's just say the Browns are, if they lose, I mean, what would you really uh, help out? Because if the Steelers do win coming off their bye week, I mean, they will move ahead of the Broncos at four and three since they own the head to head uh, tiebreaker right there. Now, like, like I said, you just got to be careful with the Chiefs. The Chiefs won't necessarily uh, move past the Steelers. And the reason why is, like I said, the AFC conference record right there. And plus, I mean, uh, when you look at common games right now, Steelers are two and two, while the Chiefs are one and three in common games. I mean, the biggest game that's going to matter is when they meet head to head. I mean, later in the year in uh, December, when you look at them. I mean, of course, I mean, that, that is definitely going to be like the hugest game uh, right there. And that is going to be, uh, I believe, uh, let's see. Yeah, Christmas weekend, the day after Christmas right there. Uh, December 26th, 325 p.m. game. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm really kind of curious to see if, like, as the season goes late later on, will this be a game that could possibly be flexed? Will this game be flexed depending where both teams stand at? Will this be moved to a Sunday night game? I'll be honest with you, I think that is a very possibility right here we'd be looking at. I mean... <laughs> Think about it. I mean, for all the Steelers fans who always want to continue to complain where it's like we're not going to be in the good position in the draft, I tell you what, though, I mean, and this is one reason why I like to have Mike Tomlin on this team for reasons like this. You still find yourself knocking on the door being in the playoffs. My only beef, like I said, I have with the guy is just not finishing when you have control. And a lot of that has to, you have to look hard in the mirror, look at your players, first of all, then the coach. I mean, because the players on the field, they got to, like, uh, step up, uh, make sure they're not making mental errors on there that could, like, really be costly decisions that could come back and hurt them. I mean, like, goofy penalties or whatever. I mean, it, it does happen. But, I mean, the, the bottom line is you do find yourself in a position right now uh, to win this game. The uh, Kansas City Chiefs, by the way, too, when we uh, look at uh, for the key games to be coming up right now, uh, they're going to be on the road uh, versus the Titans right now, who just had a big time victory over the Buffalo uh, Bills right now. Uh, Titans right now, for the most part, they're four and two. And in the AFC uh, conference right now, they're in third place as of uh, right now. Uh, so the Bills, they just uh, definitely uh, dropped some huge momentum uh, right there, to be honest with you. Ravens are the top seed, all by the Chargers. And remember, I believe it's still one team that uh, gets to buy only the top seed. So, I mean, that, that's definitely going to be an interesting uh, race throughout the season. But, I mean, yeah, Tennessee Titans right now, they got to believe they're uh, sticking their chest out a little bit, uh, being off some momentum right now. Can they uh, stop the Chiefs in Tennessee? I think that, that's going to be a good game right there. Derek Camry right there. The Kings play uh, extraordinary when you look at this guy right now. I mean, Derek Henry, I mean, who's just uh, one of the true running backs, I mean, in this game today, and you think one of the great, like, running backs in this franchise. I mean, Earl Campbell, too, went into the Hall of Fame. He only played for, what, nine seasons? But, I mean, you look at it this way right now. I mean, this guy right here, I mean, he was ran for 2,000, over 2,000 yards last year, 2,027 uh, yards right there. I mean, just uh, phenomenal what he could do. I mean, in today's game as a feature uh, running back. And his 2,027 yards ranks uh, fifth in a single season. Now, of course, the guy who still holds the record that still belongs to uh, Eric Dickerson at 2,105 uh, yards back in 1984. I mean, in the 16-game schedule error right there. They also, I mean, look at right there. I mean, O.J. Simpson, he's still on this list right now. 2,003 yards in the 14-game season back in 1973. I mean, with the Buffalo Bills. But, I mean, Henry right now, I mean, he's definitely the real deal uh, for right now. I mean, at this point, I mean, still, I mean, I, you can make an argument for him possibly being 
I mean, league MVP as a running back right now, too. I mean, for th- this season right now. And when you also look at right now, I mean, he's got, I mean, 921 yards of scrimmage right now. I mean, through the ground right now. I'd be uh, real interested to see, I mean, if he could be able to, like, uh, do that. But, man, I mean, for, I mean, th- this guy right now, what he's able to do, I mean, going on, I, I, I really be curious to see what, what he could do, I mean, throughout, I mean, this season, as far as, like, uh, putting his team on his back, I mean, uh, throughout the remainder, I mean, uh, it, it's going to really be a fun ride right now. And, uh, I mean, he's, he's got 10 touchdowns right now. He's only seven seven away from matching his career high from uh, last year of the season with 17 touchdowns on the ground. And that's a true guy with an example of smash ball football. But like I said, so once again, the AFC uh, playoff uh, pitcher in the wild card, I mean, you got right now, uh, like I said, Steelers uh, right now are ahead of the Broncos for the seven seasons. They beat them in week five, head to head. Chiefs are in the ninth seed, and the Steelers own the AFC record at two and two, while the Chiefs are at one and three. So they're ninth. You got the Browns in the 10th seed. Steelers own the AFC record over the Browns. Uh, Steelers are two and two. Browns are one and two. Colts are in the 11th seed. And the Steelers own the common gains record by virtue of being the Seahawks and Bills uh, two and one, while the Colts are 0 and two. So, like I said, big game coming up in uh, less than two days here. Uh, Browns hosting the Broncos on Thursday night football. But remember, uh, they more than likely will be out with their running backs and Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, from what I understand, too. A lot of things go into that game. And you also got the Titans hosting the Chiefs at noon on Sunday. Uh, Patriots right now. When do you ever hear this hardly happening right now? I mean, they're looking to host the one and four Jets, and they're trying to get their very first victory at home this season in Gillette Stadium. Oh, and four. Wow. What is going on, Mr. Belichick and Mac Jones, man? I mean, the Mac attack. I mean, losing a classic game, in my mind, this past Sunday to the Dallas Cowboys right now. And, I mean, I mean, Dak Prescott did, I mean, appear to have, like, a calf strain uh, coming out of that game. Hopefully he's all right, man. Because I got to tell you, man, this guy right here is definitely, I think, is going to be like comeback player of the year if he's able to continue to play right now. Unbelievable job. I mean, he's doing. I mean, I'm not sure if this would be enough for like league MVP, but I mean, I mean, this season is just uh, amazing to watch. I mean, what he's been able to do coming back from a leg injury. And I mean, just so many other quarterbacks. I mean, Dak Prescott is only fifth in the league with uh, pass yards. 1,813, 16 touchdown passes, a four interceptions right now. I mean, he's got one fourth quarter comeback, uh, two game winning drives. I mean, uh, Tom Brady might be on the verge of winning his fourth MVP. I mean, right now, when you really think about it, 17 touchdowns of three interceptions, I mean, that's a pretty phenomenal, arguable rate in his own right. For, for the most part. And you got Aaron Rodgers reigning uh, league MVP, 12 touchdowns, three interceptions. Of course, we, you know, we know what he could do as far as taking care of the ball, but, I mean, Brady right now, I mean, he's definitely uh, having a lot more fun versus a year ago when they really, truly had to grow as a team. But getting back to that, uh, let's see. And then also to some other games to watch out for this Sunday. Uh, Sunday Night Football, 49ers will be hosting the Colts, uh, 720 uh, p.m. Uh, night game right there. So that could be a game right there. I mean, the Colts, I mean, for right now, 
or looking to uh, stay on track? I mean, as far as like this season, who are uh, currently uh, two and four right now, looking to stay within striking distance of the AFC wildcard pitch right now, especially with Carson Wentz and company. And we'll see what happens from there. So let's go ahead and get into uh, some uh, roster news right now. Uh, according to Zale Lally of DK Pittsburgh Sports, uh, no timetable has uh, been has been determined for the return of Stefan Tuitt uh, just yet, according to Tomlin. Tuitt continues to work hard to return to the field. Uh, Zach Barron, for the most part, uh, he was activated off the injury reserve list, but remained inactive when, when the Steelers took on the Seahawks. Uh, the reason he was held out, according to Tom, was to get an extra week on top of the bye week to get healthy. I'm not going to lie. It's, that's going to be a real interesting one right now. Now, I mean, there, it's been a little funny, like how Zach Banner was being inserted into the slam. I mean, how he was going to be. Because uh, uh, right now, I mean, you got to think right now, as this line is starting, Joe, congratulations being activated on the roster. And now, let's see. I, if, what happens uh, from here, but yeah, uh, I'll be I'll be interested to see, like, because uh, I mean, I mean, two score four who did a tremendous job. I mean, the last couple of weeks, especially against Bob Miller. Then you got like uh, Dan Moore Jr. right now, not doing bad in my opinion at the left tackle. But Zach Bear, I mean, he's a guy who worked. I mean kept himself in, like, the uh, best shape he possibly can. Fortunately, he had the ACL tear in the first game uh, versus the Giants. Definitely got to believe it's been a long road back for him. I mean, trying to get back to this moment, getting a second chance, and trying to really uh, prove something right now that he could belong on this team and uh, help out. Because I'm not going to lie, that's uh, – I don't know if I if I if I insert him in the starting lineup just yet. I probably keep him on the bench to tell you the truth. And uh, for right now, you, you got definitely a lot of things to think about right now. I mean, even if you just like if you pull him in that lineup, as that can be better running for a guy like Najee Harris. I mean, when you look at, I mean, let's look at last year for example. I mean, when. He was in their uh, first game of the season for the Steelers when they uh, faced the New York Giants a year ago. That opening game, I mean, in that uh, contest right there, we saw the Steelers in uh, that game. Let's see what their rushing yardage uh, was. I mean, he had 30 rushing attempts for 141 yards right there. In that game, I mean, Benny Snell, he had 113 yards on the ground right there off of 19 carries. So maybe that might be some good news for, I mean, Najee Harris right there. To continue, like, uh, his rookie growth. I mean, in his Steeler and NFL career. Maybe just maybe you do need him in that situation. I mean, it wouldn't hurt. I mean, but the thing is, too, I mean, it's like, where are we going to continue to see Ben Rosberger uh, continue to, like, adapt with this offense play, play calling. I mean, make the right moves. Continue to uh, involve Najee Harris more. I mean, I, I thought he looked pretty sharp for the most part uh, on Sunday. I mean, of course, he still uh, underthrew a few passes, but not as bad as it was before. I, I feel I feel like you know like it's 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 kind of coming like in slow motion this offense. It's really starting to take form little by little, where you're starting to see guys getting some rhythm right there. I mean, look, I mean at the game summary once again. I mean versus the Seahawks in that game, and let, let's look at it right there. In, in that uh, game, when when they took on them. And which they uh, barely hung on to. Steelers, for the most part, I mean, in that game, I mean, they scored uh, 38% in their drives. I mean, when you look at it, 
I mean, 50% in overtime, but 40% in the second half right there. I mean, which wasn't that bad. But, I mean, and you held the Seahawks in totality that game 29%. So, I, I, I think that's a pretty good step in the right direction. I think he's starting to trust right now. And I'm kind of glad, like I said, I'm glad to hear Najee Harris even acknowledge like Tom Rasper like a big brother for him. And to be honest with you, as the season continues to go more and more along, I kind of like the fact they said, you know what, be uh, be bigger, be nastier, run over people. Don't be afraid to, like, you know, run over tackles. Like when he uh, mentioned about Jerome Bess, I tell you what, I think that might have been the spark that Najee was looking for, that he may have needed in his young uh, career, you could say. And I, I think that's a good thing. If anything, I, I think he needs to hear more of that. Uh, uh, ben Rossberg right now, I mean, I mean, we know he's going to be a Hall of Famer. Question is, I mean, is he going to be a, a first ballot Hall of Famer? But when you look at the observations, too, made from Mark Capoli, too, of the athletic, uh, I mean, saying all you will about having a pro first mentality, uh, Rossberg didn't step outside of could do often. He took what was given against the Seahawks, and it resulted, in his opinion, his best performance in nearly a year. Uh, granted, it wasn't perfect, but there were some occasions where he didn't seem to be on the same page as the receiver. There was no need to throw a pass right after two-minute warning with the Steelers running the ball so well. It was a position where the Steelers would have loved to run out the clock and make a field goal to win, but he read single coverage on Deontay Johnson, then chased Claypool and gave it a shot. Now, I mean, he's definitely uh, saying that you can make an argument that Rosberg chose to run part of the other run pass option more times than he should have. I mean, there were several times in that game where CL Seahawks safety, Jamal Adams, he crept out. He crept not only to the box, but all the way to the line of scrimmage, yet Rosberg chose to run it instead of throwing it. Our Stanley we wants to get the running game going, but a lack of too high safety was will allow one receiver to be single covered, and a deep shot is warranted at that point. Uh, so, yeah, I thought it was decent. I'll give uh, Rosper in that grade, I'll give in that game, I'll give him a B minus for his performance that day. Uh, and also, too, in that game, he passes, he officially passed Dan Real for fourth in the all time uh, game when he drives list with 48 right now. And he also trails Tom Brady by two games in that regard. Tom Brady's got 50 game winning drives right now. Needs three to pass him right there. So some actually great accolades uh, going into that right now for Ben Rosberger as he continues to uh, wrap up his uh, career right now. I mean, in the National Football League. I mean, very well done so far where he's been at and uh, trying to uh, keep this up uh, for the most part. And I, I got, like I said, I, I think the only biggest thing that's going to hang off in this game is that end of regulation controversy right there. I mean, with uh, DK Metcalf who caught the ball right there and then like uh, chose to rush it back to the line of scrimmage with not letting, letting the referee do that. And it was uh, definitely a mess, but hey, Steelers survive. Seventh seed, I can't say that enough right there. Two games out of the division. I'm not sure about the division. I I mean, I'll tell you what. If they could keep it within – if they could get it to, like, down, like, one game somehow. If they could get within one game of the Ravens and, and they got to face Baltimore Ravens. Remember, that first game is going to be at home, I mean, for the Steelers. Uh, versus the Ravens, and and that game is be uh, scheduled right there for December fifth uh, in that uh, contest right there, and uh, week number thirteen in, in that uh, game right there, week thirteen, December fifth, uh, three twenty five p.m. game in Heinz Field. Uh, yeah, imagine if they if they could win that game right there. Imagine being first place in the North that late in the season. I would love to see that because that would definitely be a huge thing right there. Now, now that you have uh, less than four days to hurry up 
where you got to face Minnesota Vikings on the road in Minnesota. So definitely uh, a lot staring in the face right there. But I, you know what, division, I think the Ravens are going to hang on to it. We'll see. I mean, a lot of people are having their hesitation. I still think they got that look in their eye. I mean, we're, they're going to make a run with it. I mean, and I really do believe, I mean, COVID-19 from last season especially really kind of derailed, like, uh, their decent success. Now, Grant, they did manage to win. Uh, Lamar Jackson got his first ever playoff victory. It was on the road versus Tennessee uh, Titans. Uh, payback game for the Ravens in that game right there. And I think in that game he was able to overcome his very first uh, game where he was down by 10 points or more when you looked at it. I mean, uh, it is a career and just able to just uh, play out some skeletons right there. But I mean, at the same time, too, poor guy like uh, Lamar Jackson, who in his uh, career is one and three, I mean, in the playoffs, obviously needs to get a lot better. But, I mean, in that game right there, like I said, they were down 10 to 10. That was his first ever game where he came back from the one point deficit. They were able to win that game a 20 to 13 and able to take those. So let's go into the fair foul right now. I got only one topic for the night. Uh, buying or selling the Steelers as playoff contenders or contenders for right now. Um, I'm going to have to say foul for right now. Uh, listen, they are in the seventh seed. I still think they got more ways to go. I'm not saying they can't be a playoff team. I still think they can, but for right now, I'd have to sell. I mean, you're overcoming some like a great grill momentum, but I, I got to see more improvement. I mean, more continuity, more time for this team to like really like gel, start to click. So I really do feel like it could be a matter of time where they could really uh, get a grip. They could really start uh, forming together. And that's going to be the it for this edition here of the Mass Steel Podcast. So, of course, here's truly Charles Pratt Richie. Once again, you guys can follow me on social media. Follow me on Twitter at Mass Steel CGR and on Instagram at Mass Steel Nation. So I leave you. Don't be trolling. Be rolling. Here we go. Here we go. I got it.